Not normally awake at this time. This is fascinating. I was like, there's a seven in the a.m. also? That's fascinating. All right, uh, so thank you so much for having me here. Uh, we are going to be talking about uh, love because that's the theme of this month. And I am specifically going to be talking to you about using lessons from sex therapy and from polyamory that you can apply to literally any relationship. What? <laughs> So um, first, why am I talking to you? Who am I? Uh, so my PhD is in human sexuality. Yes, that's a thing. That is an actual thing. Um, and I'm a sexuality educator. I don't do clinical practice. I uh, write. Uh, I teach in classrooms. I train future sexologists as well. So uh, I am the sex and relationships expert for philly.com. Uh, I write weekly, semi-weekly uh, in the Philadelphia Weekly. Uh, and have a, an article called Timory's Body. Uh, and I do a, a podcast called Sex with Timory that uh, deals with sexuality. So we talk to people about their personal lives, about their professional stuff, about the projects that they're working on. So I get to talk about cool stuff at my job all day. It's pretty great. I'm into it. Um, and I'm going to specifically talk to you about lessons uh, from sex therapy. So this is sort of like a uh, my professional background, and then from polyamory, which, if you're not already familiar, is gaining a lot of visibility in the last few years in mainstream media, uh, and I'm going to explain what, what that is. Don't worry. So let's start with, for real, I have the intention of, of using sex therapy to help you talk to your neighbor, to help you deal with your coworkers, to talk to your, your brother, etc. So it's absolutely true. We choose all of our relationships. Now, there is a degree in privilege, in how, there is a degree of privilege involved in being able to choose to work wherever you want, to be able to choose where you live, absolutely. Uh, we all have differing amounts of access to different places. But that said, we still choose the people who we are surrounded by. We choose the degree to which we invest in relationships. So this is about just reconceptualizing all the connections we have in our lives and thinking about them in the same way we think about, I pick my romantic partner. The same idea. You decide um, to work at a place not just because of the work, not just because of the space, but also the people that are there. You choose the apartment that you live in, not just because the location is great, but legitimately the neighbors are a part of that. Can you trust them? Do you like them? Will you want to have house parties with them? Or will you fear that your stuff's going to get stolen? So um, all of the relationships we have, the principles are the same uh, about fostering and nurturing those connections. I'm just going to talk about it from a sexy angle. <laughs> so first thinking about reconsidering relationships. The, <laughs> there's me, there's you, and it's not just about what I want, and it's not just about what you want, it's about the separate third entity that is our relationship. So the conflicts that we have are often because I'm not getting what I want, or you're not getting what you want, or getting what you want. Um, but we do much better at maintaining and fostering relationships when we don't think about it from that tally sort of perspective of what have you done for me lately, I owe you, um, this is your responsibility. But instead, thinking of a relationship as a thing in which we are mutually invested. It's both of our responsibilities. We both benefit from this, we both are hurt by this. So envisioning that with not only your romantic partners, but also just the folks that you work with, thinking about the relationship you have with your mom, etc., And they're all gonna look different, but again, the principles are the same. Why do we like and dislike some people? Now granted, some people are just nicer, some people are jerks, that's a thing, it's a real legitimate thing. Um, but there are also lots of psychological principles that go into who we are drawn to. So I have two birds of a feather, they look alike. Uh, that's a reference to homophily. The idea that not only are we drawn to those to whom we are similar, but by being around others, we become more similar. We like things to be easy to process. 
We like things to be convenient. We are attracted to people because it is simple to process what they're about. We don't want to expend a bunch of effort constantly learning and figuring things out. That's just, we're kind of lazy. We're just naturally lazy, that's a thing. So the most beautiful faces, the ones that are recognized in survey data as being the most attractive to the largest number of people, are symmetrical. They are the types that we are most likely to see, and so they are the easiest for our brains to process. We are attracted to things that don't require a lot of effort. We love it, we love it. So keeping that in mind, uh, why sometimes we fear other folks or investing in that relationship might be simply a matter of like not wanting to extend any more effort than necessary. Also the reasons that we dislike people, we have to take some ownership of that as well. Sometimes, again, legit legitimately people may be rude or unkind, but a lot of the times that we dislike someone instantly have more to do with what's going on with us. So it may be a projection based on that person reminds you of someone who was hurtful before. It might mean uh, that they are actually really similar to you and you feel like you were in competition for scarce resources. We are really likely to consider someone competition if we have a lot in common and we think that there is a limited pool. So if we're competing for attention of the same partner, if we're uh, competing for resources at work, um, quite frankly, this is the reason for working class white racism in America is because uh, folks are sold this narrative that there's a limited pool of resources and you look around and see someone as competition and they are in another group. So really taking an assessment of is this person legitimately not cool or do I just think that we're vying against each other? Um, another thing that we often don't like is when someone else does a thing that we don't like in ourselves. So for instance, in my dissertation, uh, which was on how your relationship with your body affects who you want to date, that's what I studied, um, we found that people who had either gained or lost a significant amount of weight were more likely to value thinness in their partners because it was something that was important to them. So because I monitor that in my own self, if I have a lot of feelings tied into that for my own identity, I therefore value that externally. It's more important to me and my partners as well. So when, you, when we have a conflict with another person, to again, search what's going on and why the reaction is as strong as it is, is it really what happened? Or is it that feeling that they evoked and what is that feeling like? So dealing with relationships, using things from sex therapy. It's Robin Thicke. <laughs> This is from when the song Sex Therapy came out, before we realized what a D-bag he was. <laughs> so things we can learn from sex therapy. So the first one up there is active listening. And you're probably uh, familiar with this concept uh, as just being present, hearing what the person has to say. Uh, it has to do with just making sure that you understand legitimately what is being conveyed to you and what their experience is when they're telling you. So when someone tells you um, their problem, not only listening for the content of it, but the context for them. So that's just an empathy piece. Like, what does this mean to this person? Um, what are the, the things that I know about them that fit into why they're reacting this way? So we're not only going to listen to the words, but observe signs of emotionality and then respond back to them with affirmation that we understand. So this is going to be clarifying that what I heard is what you meant. There's a big difference between listening for arguments and listening to make sure you understand their emotional content and what is happening for them. There's a big difference between listening to argue and listening to understand. But if we're approaching it from that, we're both invested in this third entity. We're instead going to approach conflict resolution like we are two detectives solving a mystery. Right? So I have some of the data over here. I know my perspective. I know what I saw. I know how I felt. You were another detective. You felt and saw other stuff. Why don't we bring this together? And when we have all the information accumulated, then we can resolve the conflict as opposed to yeah, but what you did. Yeah, but 
no, and, and then there was that time, and you totally. And another facet of active listening is how you tell your side of it. So it's not, you did this, you did this, and then this was another thing you did wrong. Instead, it's, when this thing happened, this is how I felt. It takes out the assumption that you understand someone else's motivation. So it's not, when you say this thing about my outfit, instead of being like, when you called me ugly, or when you, whatever, because that's, that's how uh, I internalized it. So it's not, about, um, it's not about putting motivation onto you and assuming that I know where you're coming from, but instead conveying to you what I heard. So we take the responsibility away. One of the um, examples that sex therapist Dave Schwartz uses as a, like a really hyperbolic example is rather than when you were gonna shoot me, I was scared. You don't actually know that that person was going to shoot you and that immediately places the onus on them. Instead, the more accurate term would be, when I saw that gun pointed at me, <laughs> I felt scared. So then we have a different conversation I'm owning up to my own feelings, as opposed to blaming you for making me feel that way. So active listening is a two-way street. It is both me owning my own response to things that happened, and making sure that I am understanding you doing the same thing. Yay? <laughs> On active listening? All right. Um, we're also going to be approaching uh, conflict resolution like a mystery, uh, because relationships uh, are often modeled for us in a very specific way. There is an idea that relationships look a certain way. This is how they are done. We've been together for this many months. These are the words you should have said by this point. We've been together for this long. We should live in the same place, etc. That that's what people do. And so there are misunderstandings that come up when we have different narratives about that. This is where I come from. This is what that means. When you're dating somebody, these are the expectations. This is what people do. How could you do the thing that doesn't go along with that narrative? So instead, we have to build the narrative together. We're getting off the relationship escalator. Has anyone heard the term relationship escalator? This has got to change your mind. <laughs> All right. So the relationship escalator is that idea. We hopped on the escalator at the same time. We're going to all go up at the same pace and you stay with that person on the same level. You only go one direction. And apparently there's a top to it. <laughs> like, how long do you want to be on that step? Maybe longer than the escalator wants you to be. Um, maybe you want to go up a little bit, and then you find out. <laughs> so maybe you just want to like, sit on one of the steps for a while. Maybe you want to hang out there. Maybe you have no intention of going to that next floor that has no appeal to you or would be a bad idea. So hopping off the relationship escalator and instead of being like, this is what we should do, this is what is normal, being like, what actually are you looking for? What do you actually want? And what do you want out of relationships in general? Like, what do you, what do you need uh, for you to feel satisfied and happy about your relationships? Now, so far I've been talking about it in kind of a dating way, because the relationship escalator is about dating, um, but this is applied to all relationships. There's no one way to be neighborly. There's no one way to be co-workers co uh, together. Obviously, there's like professional decorum, and we want to maintain um, healthy boundaries in all relationships, which we're not necessarily great at, um, because we need to be able to separate and compartmentalize so that we can accomplish our jobs. Um, but this, this can be applied in any relationship by simply identifying what it is you actually want and need rather than expecting to fit schemas. So for instance, a very common conflict in sexual relationships is amount of sex that people want to have. I want to do it X number of times a week. My partner only wants to do it like Y times a month. What is, what is the way to bridge that gap? Some people are like, well, we split the difference. We'll do it like, I don't know, like once a week or whatever. Then everyone has compromised. Everyone has sacrificed. No one is happy. Everyone is resentful. I'm not getting what I want. Um, you're feeling like you're being coerced into doing a thing that you don't want to. Everyone feels powerless and unhappy. And if we were to put this in a um, geographic 
metaphor, you'd see how silly it is. So let's say I want to live in New York, my partner wants to live in LA. The solution is not to move to Kansas. <laughs> no one is happy, we all lose. Instead, I'm going to identify what is it about New York that I like. So I need to live in a major metropolitan area. I need to know that there's a lot of arts and culture. And my partner will say, like, what I like about LA is that it's really near the beach and there's a lot of like Latin culture. Maybe the solution's to move to Miami. So it's not cutting it halfway down the center and calling that a compromise. It's identifying our needs and then actually coming up with another solution where our needs are met as opposed to breaking it apart into expectations and uh, limited schemas. Um, sensate focus. So in sex therapy, sensate focus is a practice to deal with sexual dysfunction by taking away all goals. So for instance, let's say you go in with a partner, you're having some sort of sexual dysfunction where it's just not going along the way that you expected to or wanted to. And what Sensate Focus is going to do is first, you're gonna take away all that you have previously identified as sex. And this is a, this is a, a thing you would do with a therapist. Uh, you wouldn't just do this on your own, you'd have a lot of coaching in it. Uh, but the first phase is like taking away any concept of things that would lead to orgasm. That's not the intention, that's not the desire. What you do instead is you're gonna devote a specific amount of time to just giving pleasure to your partner for your own pleasure. So it's not about leading them to a specific level of arousal, but just feeling the landscape of their body just for your own sake, which is like something we drop after a while in a lot of sexual relationships. So it's taking away all that we have gotten used to all of our habits, all of our routines, all of this. Well, I know this will work. This has worked for a long time. Because at some point, if it doesn't work, then, oh, what are we going to do? That always used to work. That used to work in about seven, eight minutes. And now it's not working at all. So we take that all away. Take away that like goal-oriented, there's something I'm trying to accomplish here. And instead, just traverse the landscape of your partner. Experience them, though, they're entirely new and for your own sake and you reciprocate that. And eventually you add back in the elements that you might have had in your relationship before. But the idea is take away the goal-oriented nature and the idea that there was a right way to do this and this is the way we've always done it, so that is what we're trying to get back to. Because the way we've always done things isn't necessarily most sustainable for us. Same thing with any other relationship. Just because my sister and I have always had this dynamic doesn't mean that this is actually gonna work. So we're gonna take away those elements. And ideally, you are collaborating with someone who is equally invested in this relationship. That's not always necessarily the case, but uh, you can do your side of it at least um, by just trying to scale back and change the way that you interact, approaching it as though it's a new relationship without the baggage, without um, all the anger and resentments that we've, we've built up. And finally, scheduling sex or like whatever. <laughs> So, realistically, adults are busy and they have to sometimes schedule sex. There's nothing wrong with that. Just because you planned for a party doesn't make it less fun. <laughs> making time for friends that you've fallen apart from, making time to sure, be sure that you call grandpa. I need to put that in my phone real fast to call my grandpa. Yeah. So, uh, setting uh, what the priorities are in your life. Realistically, we care about our jobs, we care about lots of different things, but relationships are what affect our mental health most significantly. So if it is a priority in your life, act like it. Make the choices that you do for the things that you care most about, so prioritize them. And schedule sex or whatever. <laughs> now lessons from Bobby Henry. <laughs> so this is, this is just a few different, um, dynamics of polyamory. Polyamory overall is a form of ethical non-monogamy. So relationship escalator says you are with one person and if you are with any more than that, it's not real. And it has to be um, something that is, is usually pretty based in gender roles and there's a lot of expectations that like you're with one person and that's what this looks like and this is how often you see each other and these are the things you're gonna do. Uh, polyamory says, Nah, though. 
So you can, you can design a relationship that fits your needs. So the one on the far left is a V. So that would be one person who is dating two other people. Uh, that is just one version. There's, this is a limitless thing. It's just as, as many people as are possibly involved. A triad would be there's three people and they're all dating each other. And those two are the ones you're most likely to see depicted in media. Those are the versions that will make it into movies and stuff. A polycule, which you see there on the right, is what's actually more likely to occur in real life, is a network of people. So for instance, I have my two or three lovers, and then this partner has two or three lovers, and this person has one, et cetera. And it's a network of people who are all interconnected. And in most poly communities, um, that's what it really looks like in real life. So. Um, one day that'll be how it's actually depicted in the media. But that is a polycule. So it's a little mini network. It's like a nuclear family. Um, things that we can take away from polyamory. So I'm just gonna address this cartoon real fast. <laughs> Do you enjoy watching your partners make out because you're a master of compersion or a creepy voyeur? Can't I be both? <laughs> uh, so compersion, compersion, I just wanna address that word real fast. Uh, compersion is the opposite of jealousy. It is pleasure that I feel because you feel pleasure. So knowing that you are feeling love from another person fills me with happiness. Because I love you and I want you to be happy. So compersion is a thing we want to cultivate because in a world with the relationship escalator and the expectation that monogamy is the only way to do things, we cultivate jealousy. And jealousy is really useful Jealousy is like physical pain. It is an alert that something needs to change. And jealousy isn't just in romantic relationships. Jealousy exists in every relationship, and it is a function to alert you. So it's an opportunity to assess, why am I reacting to this particular thing? So in a romantic context, let's say that I feel really jealous when my partner talks to this particular person. In a, in a context with the relationship escalator and the expectation of monogamy, the solution is you don't talk to that person because it makes me feel bad and you don't want me to feel bad. And, and my partner will be like, I don't want you to feel bad, so I'll stop talking to that person. But that doesn't help anything. It doesn't address why is it that person and not other people. But in a context where we are trying to cultivate compersion and use jealousy as an alert, I get to think about what is it about that person? Again, going back to why we like some people and we don't like other ones, Maybe that person has traits that I don't have, and so now I'm like, well, maybe you actually like that better. Because you can't possibly like more than one person. You can't possibly like more than one thing. If you like someone with red hair, you can't possibly also like blondes, or something like that. So it gives me an opportunity to be like, what is it about that person that I like or don't like? Are we too similar? Are we too different? Is it reminding me of some other insecurity that I have? And it's the same thing with any other relationship. So I see my coworker is doing really well. Stuff is going great for them. Their projects are just fantastic and their career is escalating quickly. Um, I might feel really jealous about that. The reason isn't necessarily that I don't like that person, just simply that I want that for myself. And this is a really good alert. Okay, so maybe I need to like switch up my game or maybe self, you know, it's just a rut right now. Maybe I wanna talk to that person about collaborating or some otherwise uh, finding more resources. So jealousy is functional in the same way that physical pain is functional. And compersion, when we tap into it, is our ability to derive joy for them. So my coworkers doing well, if I feel good for them and maintain a strong relationship with them, they could bring me with. And as they get more and more connections and they get these opportunities and they might need somebody on their team, they'll reach back to somebody they like working with. Someone who makes them happy. So it's to our own benefit to sort through this stuff and figure out what our feelings are about. So designing, oh, metamors. So metamors, is anyone familiar with the term metamors? There's a new word, yay, this is great. <laughs> this is fantastic. So metamor, so meta, above, larger picture, uh, amor, like paramour is my lover. Metamor is my lover's lover. So I'm not directly dating them, but I am connected to them through my lover. So in relationships outside of dating, we have people who we are not directly working with, we are not necessarily directly friends with, but because they interact with the folks we care about or work with, 
they do affect us. So we need to care about them simply because there are residual effects for us personally and for those we work with and care for. So considering relationships outside of just those you have committed to or, or you're connected to. So in a network of people, we're all affecting each other. And we can use all of these techniques, all these active listening techniques, all of these like searching our jealousy, all of this tapping into our compersion with all of those people. So if you're dating my partner, I don't really have to necessarily care about how your day went, but I do want to keep up a good relationship because there's going to be a day where I just have just a garbage work day and everything goes wrong and I really need my partner to hang out with me, but I know you already made plans. Could you maybe swap nights with me? Because I really need this right now. And if you're cool with each other, yeah, that's fine. Like, we're, we're friends, we can make this work. If you think of that person as your enemy competing for energy, those things aren't gonna happen. And it's the same thing with coworkers, with siblings, etc. So maintaining these good relationships, even if you're not directly trying to spend a bunch of time with them. Um, any other things I wanna add on polyamory? Um, I feel like I'm gonna move on to this next thing just because people didn't know what metamors and all that were. So I'm going to take this to, to questions. How are we doing? <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna check it. What, what questions do we have on these concepts so far? Because I want to keep going, but I want it to be useful to you. Yeah. So a question for metamors in a B relationship mm -hmm. is what if the person you're extending to, uh, your metamor mm -hmm. is obstinate and doesn't want to play part of that uh, transaction or relationship? So um, you're in a V and your metamor with whom you share a partner is not good at negotiating, is, is stubborn, et cetera. That's a real thing. <laughs> That's totally a real thing. Um, so realistically, that relationship is going to just be difficult. Um, and m it depends on the existing dynamics. So for instance, like, did that person predate you? Was that person involved with your lover like for 10 years and you just came in and they're like used to things going a certain way? That's gonna be very different than we've all been dating for about eight months and you just need to get, get it together. <laughs> like, so this is, uh, this is how poly networks tend to work, is just that like, if you enter into this lifestyle, you have this perspective towards life, this idea that we want this for ourselves, we want to be able to have multiple lovers, we want to have a lifestyle where this is um, expe expected and normal, uh, I just have to approach with a much more open-minded thing. That kind of stubborn thing is just not gonna fly. Realistically, it's, it's sort of on them. So um, you can't make anybody do anything, um, but certainly uh, the hope would be that your, your mutual partner would be like, I thought you wanted to do poly. If you want to do poly, you're gonna have to like, work with other people, just realistically. So um, people aren't perfect, and they're not necessarily good at this stuff immediately. You're overcoming years of conditioning that tells you that this is all wrong. So, um, it's not, it's not always easy. The, um, the thing about making ethical non-monogamy work is if you think that you have communicated your point comprehensively, you've said absolutely everything that you have thought and felt, you haven't said enough. You need to communicate more. Uh, that's just realistic, because we operate on a lot of assumptions and uh, expectations that other people understand things that they don't necessarily. So that would be an opportunity for a lot more communication. So not necessarily that metamor is stubborn, but so I would like to be flexible on these things and that doesn't seem to be working for you. Um, what, is it, what does it make you feel when I ask to switch nights? What is the fear that that evokes? Do you think that I'm trying to take too much time? Do you have a life that just isn't um, conducive to moving things around quickly that if we, swip, if we switch nights now, you're not gonna be able to see each other for like three weeks or something. Finding out what that obstinance really is. So investing in their narrative and finding out what it is for them. Thank you. Can you speak to the dynamics of sexuality-based or social media-based or post-crime-based shifts from within the populations of sexuality groups? Do you see more 
changes uh, with more heterosexual couples become more polyamorous or more gay couples become more monogamous. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's a, that's a super interesting thing. So um, in gay male culture, uh, consensual non-monogamy has been the norm for a very long time. And uh, there has been a lot of respectability politics around like if we're going to give equal rights to uh, gay couples, they need to prove that they want to be part of the system. And what that system looks like is you buy a house and you have one partner, et cetera. And like that's acceptable, so now you get rights. So there has been some pressure for uh, LGBT people to scale back uh, poly. Um, but realistically, poly in general, ethical non-monogamy in general, uh, has gained more visibility. So more people are open about it and uh, practicing it. So um, it's become much more mainstream in terms of um, heterosexual people. And there's also, because of the interconnectedness, it's, it's, it's often been very appealing for people who are bisexual, pansexual, otherwise queer, uh, who want to have partners of different genders. So um, in general, we're seeing a lot more visibility. Though realistically, in a historical context, most marriage has been poly. Like if you look at, for instance, the Bible, the Bible has more polygyny, which is multiple wives, then it has monogamy. Oh, marriage is an economic institution and women as uh, property, <laughs> then you get as many of them as you can buy. And if you don't have a lot of money, then you go in with your brothers and you get one wife and that's when you see polyandry because otherwise it doesn't happen a whole lot. But uh, polyandry is multiple husbands. Polygyny is multiple wives. Polyamory is many loves. So it doesn't necessarily ascribe marriage or dating status it has more to do with the idea that uh, you're in a relationship and you're choosing to be. So just to define those terms. Let me answer your question. Okay. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about cultivating conversion and you know, like any practical examples of like a moment in which you might identify jealousy and use that, like is there an exercise or a tip for helping to engender or cultivate conversion in yourself or yeah. talk about it with other yeah. people? Yeah, compersion is hard because we are not generally taught to cultivate that. Um, if, if you feel it instinctively, some people just are more likely to feel compersion than others just because it just personality differences. Um, you just like attach to that feeling and go with it. Same as like cultivating anger in yourself. You can choose to like dive deeper into that anger and feel all of the anger or you can be like, I feel angry right now. Let me calm myself down and feel less of this let me distract myself, um, et cetera. So with compersion, part of that is, some of it will naturally arise. When something great happens for your friend, it's usually pretty easy to be like, yay, friends, good job, that's great. So when you see those things happening for yourself, cultivate that and be like, how did I feel, what prompted that? It clearly wasn't necessarily a win for me directly, but I felt great about it. Um, in terms of sexual relationships, compersion can be cultivated simply by, um, it's, it's, it's really a form of empathy. So it's really about viewing the world through the lens of your partner and thinking, this makes my partner really happy. I want my partner to be happy. I know that my partner finds this person attractive or I know that my partner <laughs> likes to do this activity or I know my partner is really into whatever. And it might not be something I care about. I don't care about that video game. I don't care about that sport. I don't want to watch football, but it makes you so happy. <laughs> so just um, trying to, to the best of your ability, put yourself in your partner's position. So you don't necessarily want the same things they do, have the same reactions, but you know enough about them that you can kind of guess. And you previously have experienced sensations similar to what they are experiencing. So you've felt attractions to people. You've felt excited about stuff. So just putting those pieces all together to be able to view it through their lens and like cultivating that energy flow as opposed to being like, I'm feeling not great. Let's focus on that. <laughs> Good question. Are we good? <laughs> oh, we got another one. We got another one. I'm going to take this one. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. You are naming the existential problem. Yeah. So when when you are in a relationship with one person, it takes a lot of energy. Um, when you have multiple people in the network, it is not just double; it is exponential because it's not just my relationship with you; it's your relationship with them and my relationship with my metamor. It's all of those things, and so it's just an exponential more uh, amount of efforts are required. So. The, the comparison that I would want to make is like, why do some people have kids? It looks like a lot of work. <laughs> it looks like a lot of work. But there's something about that that you want that makes it seem worthwhile. So it's about uh, making choices in your life depending on what is going to work for you. So this is not to say that everybody should do uh, non-monogamy. I'm not at all trying to come out here and proselytize. I'm not saying this is better or worse. This is just explaining a reality. Um, and not everybody will be happy in non-monogamy, by any means. Um, but for some folks, what they're getting out of it is worth the effort. So maybe it's um, one, of the, one of the issues with the expectation of, of normalizing monogamy is that that person has to be the best match for you. You're effectively shopping for a best person. With non-monogamy, I get to just interact with you for who you are. I get to enjoy that you're good at these things and we have these shared interests. And then this other person can fulfill these other needs. And I don't need you to go with me to horror movies. And I don't need them to go hiking with me because we have that. So that's, that's the upside is um, that you have a bigger support network too. So in, um, in some like poly families, you actually have like a, a built-in system of childcare. You can share housing costs, et cetera. So there are upsides, there are downsides. But, with anything that you want to do, there's effort required. <laughs> Valid, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you.